All right, we have come to the end of our second round, which means it's time for the final round. And those are the questions that I hope you guys will find most exciting. Those are the questions that have come from the audience. Uh, you've, given us, you've given us some really good ones. Uh, some students in the audience want to know for our historian, how would you alter the current history books for new generations? They'd like to know of our representative for language and literature, what one book you would preserve aside from the Bible. They'd like to know what song you guys sing to get yourself pumped up in the morning. They would also like to know if you would fund, if you would fund Planned Parenthood. Uh, we can have opportunities for all of those questions later on, but we've got a select few that we're going to go with tonight. And our first question from a student is this. I think we will start with Dr. Adams in this one. Understanding the materials that are necessary for your fields, how will you continue to advance, teach, or demonstrate your specialties if you no longer have the materials or technology needed for your subject of study? There are no machines, no books, no paper, no pencils. So I think that and we just at bare minimum uh, we can actually, you know, as chemists and biochemists follow upon the, the nuances that it, 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 it historians as well as those who are in the humanities uh, rely upon in order to deliver information. And that's about telling the story. Um, I think that at its fundamental and at, at, at its bare roots. If, 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 if as a biochemist or chemist, we're not, we're not giving any resources to re relate the information needed to understand molecular structure, as well as atoms and how they interact with each other. I think that we have to resort to our own brain, the, 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 the fact that we have developed as chemists and biochemists the ability to critically think and be able to communicate that word of mouth, because that, at, at its fundamental, that's how this got started in the first place. When the DNA hits were solved, there were no computers as well. So there were very, very few resources in that, in that thing. So I think that, that talking, teaching, one-on-one, one-on-one, I'm sorry, is, uh, would, would be not only the most effective, but it would probably be the one way that will truly work because we, the compassion as a chemist and, and the, the compassion that I feel in, in, the, in the work that I'm trying to teach to, the, to, 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 to my students would be shown in any other way. We, we could not be shown in any better way. Are we all allowed opportunities to answer the same question? Or yes, no everyone's or answering this question. The question. Okay. So uh, are you say there's nothing, there's no, there's no bachelor's, no books, nothing? No machines, no books, no paper, no pencils. Okay. It's another well, question on that. Yeah. So it, it's all about memory and what we, uh, what we retain. Uh, so the way that, uh, uh, as I said, history is about the future is really to uh, have that transmitted from your memory into the future, but also how to build uh, the future based on that set of human skills that you learn by studying the human in its actual condition, in its actual behavior, not fictional behavior, and again, it's not a type of literature, but, you know, because literature is actually, it goes even deeper into the human but of how they actually acted. And so even without those books, said the book, the book that uh, uh, the protagonist of Time Machine tries to grab crumbles in his hands, but he is that connection. And that connection will be you once you have learned the skills of history and you will have retained that, transmitted to these, uh, whatever they will be, zombies, eloys, uh, warlocks, but that's what you will have to tell them how to do it and how to get there to the point you need to have. The beauty of that biology is it's alive. <laughs> so the easiest way to teach biology without everything else that we that we typically use to teach it is to use the organisms that we study, whether they be plants, whether they be the bacteria that may be on your food or not on your food, so that in a new world like this you begin to understand critical aspects of microbiology and food safety. We can study organisms to understand how they function, how they interact with each other, so that we can understand biology at its base without the need for all of the other tools that we've lost. So I think I may actually have the easiest job in that context. <laughs>
literature has been around before there were pen paper and pencils. So literature has been around and storytelling has been around since the, since the time that humans decided to start writing stories on the walls of caves. And so we'll either start there again or we'll keep our stories alive via oral tradition, which is also the beginnings of all literary traditions. They all go back to oral storytelling. Um, and it will encompass all of the knowledge that we have. We will tell stories about everything that we know. And the way that we'll be able to remember it is by crafting stories around it. I can throw a bunch of facts at you, but you won't remember a list of random facts unless I tie a narrative that makes sense around that. <laughs> that was the end of the first question. I should know that. Second question coming from our audience, and I like this one. We will start with Dr. Broji on this one. Yes, sir. If you had to pick another area of expertise, another field of study besides your own that would be needed in a post-apocalyptic world, which would you pick? <laughs> Just saying now, I'm using this paper for my survival. Uh, so uh, I will uh, use the uh, big accent here, which is uh, what people think is the, is the most useless, perhaps. Uh, it's philosophy. Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> because, uh, because uh, again, it, it, this, is, this is a disaster. It, it's, a, it's a total disaster that, yes, it affected our physical world but it even more affected our mind. And sure, my discipline, history can help uh, with all the lessons from the past and research skills and all you want. Literature can help, can give you comfort, but philosophy really is the best tool to help you cope with it. You know, when you say take it with philosophy, that's what you mean. about this, there are two disciplines that come to mind actually that I've represented tonight. Um, that, that is uh, psychology and political science. Um, and and I, I say that from um, two standpoints. Um, we, we are coming, we are, we, are, we are in a situation post-apocalyptic where we have to really come together. And I think by understanding uh, one another, how, how I'm trying to have a better understanding of how people, how people think will help us to establish infrastructures that are needed for us to be proliferate as a new society. With that infrastructure and being in place, we need to have leadership. I think by understanding the nature of how uh, organizations work from a political standpoint or, or, or a scientific uh, and interactive standpoint as, as, as potential leaders uh, will, will allow us really to have a good, uh, good head start on rebuilding what's been going on. Um, so one of the things that I think is great about American, education, American higher education system is that it adapts and evolves. Uh, one of the things that, I'm just going to adapt and evolve the, the nature of this question too. Uh, one of the things that's wonderful about the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences too is that we, know, we not only have so many diverse disciplines, but we have a tremendous amount of interdisciplinary programs. And so if I were to major in something besides English, well, I minored in history. <laughs> um, but if I were to, I have a PhD though in English and women's studies. And so I would actually choose an interdisciplinary program, and I'll go ahead and say gender studies, for example, where you know the value of multiple disciplines, but all from a critical perspective, are, are key. So if that was, if that was, if I was training not to be a professor, but to be a, a survivor in a post-apocalyptic world, I would pick an interdisciplinary program. We were given the scenario that there was one spot on a boat, so I'm assuming there's some other individuals in this boat. Uh, first of all, after tonight, I'd probably kick those individuals out of the boat and put the people in this table in the boat. So that, that's part where I'd, that's part where I'd start. Uh, and we build our own, yeah, we build our own boat. We have the capability here. Y'all go on your boat. <laughs> I think 
Another discipline that's not represented here tonight, but is, in fact, the basis for chemistry and the basis for biology is physics. I didn't, another one of those courses as an undergraduate, Lord, I did not want to go to that class. <laughs> and yet, I find it every day explaining many of the observations, or using it, trying to use it to explain many of the observations I make. And I can only imagine that in a post-apocalyptic world, that understanding the physical environment around me would be able, would allow me to manipulate that environment to, again, create resources to get me to tomorrow, and then to next week, and then to next month when I can begin to think about social issues that may be arising. <laughs> so that's where I would go, is in, is in physics and physical sciences. So we started down here, we went back down this way. I don't know where we're going to start here, but we're going to go a little road and we're going to collapse the last question from the student audience in with the closing arguments in the interest of time. So we will take three minutes rather than two for closing arguments and answering this question in front of us. We have a volunteer to start. For closing arguments? In addition to this question. So you'll answer this question and combine your closing argument with it. Dr. Adams. All right. So we will each have three minutes for this. This is the last you're going to hear from all of these folks before we vote. Many of you have discussed how your discipline would help us survive. However, I hope we could thrive. How does your field deepen the meaning of life? <laughs> How does chemistry and biochemistry deepen the meaning of life? I think I can sum it up by pointing out that a fundamental understanding of chemical processes requires that we, that we understand how um, uh, entities at the smallest, le at the smallest level, uh, individual molecules, electrons, protons, neutrons, how they come together to form atoms, how they form come together from molecules that actually interact with each other in a diverse number of ways in order to proliferate larger micro, micro as well as macro medical uh, entities. With that being said, that fundamental understanding of those type of components can be applied to what goes on inside cells. So bio means life. So by having an understanding of chemistry, we then have to then begin to develop an understanding of what, what, kind of chemistry, what kind of chemistry or how chemistry it relates to life, an understanding of biochemistry. And I think that this is one of the most strengthening aspects of deepening the meaning of life from the standpoint of understanding the basic fundamentals of biochemistry and chemistry. With that being said, as I close, I, I, I have to say that um, it is imperative that we understand that the core curriculum as related as, as is related in the, as in the J. William Fulbright College is vital to not only our success in graduating, but it's vital to our success in, become, in becoming positive citizens, role models, and future leaders. Uh, without the historical context, you don't really know where you can go. Without the ability to communicate and be humanistic and relay that information and be able to, to proliferate the human side, there's really uh, very little you can do as a scientist, whether or not in my opinion you're a chemist or a hard chemist. So for that standpoint, also understanding that we live in a time now uh, that's, a, that's different than what goes before. Uh, I can remember using a phone booth to make a phone call. Um, when I was sitting where you all are, uh, we had something called a beep. Somebody beat you, you looked at the phone number, and you went to the phone booth to go and call it. I, I did not know what a laptop was until I was an adult. I used, my first computer was a Mac 2C computer that was about the size of this piece of paper. It was one box and it sat on the, on, on the, on the desk. And com compared to what the computers we use now, it took an eternity to do anything with. Science and technology, though, is a rapidly changing field, particularly in today's society. And by having a fundamental uh, understanding of things such as chemistry, and allows you to do a, a number of different things. 
you can actually go with a chemistry degree and go to law school, not in, in addition to the med school, general school, any other, other professional uh, uh, opportunities or options you'd like to uh, you know, pursue. But because you have that fundamental, holistic, more broad education, even if you choose one particular major in, in this core curriculum, within this college, you can do anything you want. And I think at the end of the day, it, won't, it doesn't matter which one of the four of these disciplines are left on this boat. The, 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 the society is going to thrive because each of these disciplines are vital to the survival of us as a people. A last word from history. How do you deepen the meaning of life? Uh, yes, we are, we are uh, also in the closing arguments, which actually ties in with the, with the answers, uh, the answer I want to give to, to this question, because we, uh, in this struggle for survival, we all want to show a little bit of solidarity, uh, and because uh, I do think that the meaning of life lies in that kind of uh, solidarity. And, uh, uh, you know, we all uh, would like to make room for all these disciplines. Uh, knowledge, in general, means freedom and it's precious. And uh, yes, I could say that history is about everything. You will learn about bio how biologists made their discoveries in the history of sciences. You will learn about how art expressed humanity through the history of art. You will find that li uh, what literature made us inquire about our inner selves through the history of literature. And you will find how business was rebuilt through the history of past business that failed and reemerged. And you will do all this with the best research skills and the best frame of mind to understand those achievements and apply them into your future. Everything, everything is gone. You look ahead and see answers from what all of us, not just one of us, have been and have offered. Yes, history is about everything. Uh, it's the most inclusive of all. And as survivors, you want a bit of all that humanity has to offer and still has to offer. Handing yourself to a specialized field will narrow your mind. And as much as I would love to see all of us on that boat, because I am <coughs> uh, I have to say that as you are still seeking to answer all questions, not just how to craft vital chemical compounds or seek solace in the beauty of a poem, then history can give you all that you will need for your future. Deepen in the meaning of life. Many of you have discussed how your discipline will help us survive. However, I hope we can thrive. How does your field deepen the meaning of life? The, at the cornerstone, at the cornerstone of my discipline, is a desire to understand how each living organism depends on the other in order to continue on and survive. In an apocalyptic world. Heck, in a now world, we don't fully appreciate it. I would hope that in an apocalyptic world, my discipline might have a, an overriding role in helping to understand the relationships between organisms and our inter interdependence. We would have a better understanding of issues to why diseases spread. I take as an example. I don't need to get flu vaccine every year. Same. How many, how many of you know that the reason you have to get a flu vaccine is because a virus, which isn't a lot, is passed from birds, it gets passed to pigs or chickens that live in close proximity to humans. The interdependence. It can be interdependence that leads to disease. It can be interdependence that leads to your, leads to your ability uh, to thrive. So uh, I think that my discipline plays a critical role in that. Uh, so I, I think in a post-apocalyptic world, uh, I actually would hope that my discipline would take a leadership role in that. And that's not to diminish anything else at the table, but maybe take a leadership role that, that is even greater than what it is now, because I would challenge the average person on the street to understand how those relationships between li living organisms affect you every day. And that's why we tend to take them for granted. We don't know about them. And we only know about them after we've eliminated something and went, uh-oh. <laughs> so with that, that's my closing argument. Last up, our representative from
from English. One of the things that, that I was an avid reader as a young child, and one of the things that solidified my interest in studying literature professionally was the fact that you couldn't possibly study literature effectively without having a strong understanding of the numerous contexts from which any given piece of literature emerges and how it continues to evolve based on new uh, contexts through adaptations, appropriations, uh, and different takes on the story. So the study of literature requires the study of history. The study of literature requires a strong understanding of what science, what scientific ideas, advancements, and technology.